Hello guys and welcome to CodePick. In this video, we will be looking at the math behind machine learning. I hope I got you excited, so let's get started. Welcome back guys. In this video, we will start off by learning some basic concepts like Python numerical types, basic math function, NumPy arrays and finally matrices. Matrices are fundamental in most computational application because of its connection between matrices and the solution of linear equations. Hence, stick till the end of the video so you don't miss out on the important concepts. I intend this video to be beginner friendly so you can refer back to it whenever you feel stuck or you just need a quick refresher. With that said, without wasting any time, let's get started. Just to keep things simple for now, we will be using REPL an online editor to run our code. You can find a link to it in the description below if you want to follow along or you can just fire up your favorite editor. Just a heads up before we move on. As you probably know by now, Python offers built-in numerical and mathematical functions that are good for applications that have a very minimal calculation. But in our current and upcoming videos, nowhere we will be making use of basic functions. Thankfully, for us, the community has offered NumPy and Sci-Fi modules, which help us perform complex math operation and operate efficiently on arrays. So, let's install these modules first. If you are on your local machine, you could do something in terms of Python 3.8-m pip install numpy scipy. You can find this command in the description below. or if you are on REPL like I am, you could head over to the package section, the third one from the top and first search for NumPy. Now I will click on the first search result and you can see it tells us that NumPy is the fundamental package for array computing in Python. Sounds like the exact thing we want. Next we will click on the plus icon and just like that we have installed NumPy. All we need to do now is search for SciPy and click on the first search result. It says SciPy is a scientific library for Python. Looks intriguing, right? Let's just click on the plus icon and wait for it to install the package. Now that we have those out of the way, we will first learn some of the basic Python numerical types that we might have missed out. If you have any previous experience with Python, you know it offers a basic numerical type like integers and floats. Now let's learn some of the complex built-in types that Python offers us out of the box. The first one is a decimal type. We use the decimal type in applications that require decimal digits for accurate arithmetic operation. So let me just give you a quick example. First let's import a decimal and the way you do that is from decimal import decimal. Notice that I have the capital D at the end. Let's just create variables called num1 which is equal to decimal 1.1 and num2 which is equal to decimal 1.563. Let me just print the result of adding num1 and num2. Once I hit the run on the top, you see on the right we get 2.663 as expected, right? Nothing complex in that. You might be wondering why am I showing this? To explain to you, let me just create two new variables and this time around the variables will be floating point numbers instead of decimals. Num3 and Num4 will be floating point numbers with the value 1.1 and 1.563 and adjust print the sum of Num3 and Num4. Look what happens when we run it this time around. You see in case we perform the operation using floating point, the result contains a small error arising from the fact that certain numbers cannot be represented exactly using a finite sum of power of 2. Let us look at another example. Here the binary expansion of 0 0.1 is 0 0.00011 and it goes on and it never terminates. So any floating point representation of a number will always contain a small error. Although this may sound trivial and insignificant now, consider a scenario where you are building a financial software where precision is everything and you don't want to approximate the values, right? The decimal type represents decimal number exactly by using the power of 10 rather than the power of 2, which means that it can safely be used 
for calculations where the accumulation of rounding errors would have a dire consequence. Just like every good thing in the world, decimal types have a drawback. They are less memory efficient since they store decimal digits rather than binary digits. Before we wrap up, I want to show you some important methods that you will mostly be using if you are using decimal types. The first one is context. The decimal package provides context object which allows fine grained control over precision display. The default context can be accessed using the get context function from the decimal module. The context object returned by get context has a number of attributes that can be modified. So let's import get context from the decimal package like this from decimal import get context. Next, let's create a new variable called ctx and run our get context function. Now I will create a new variable called num and set it to decimal 1.1. Let me just print out the result of 1.1 to the power of 4. So the result is 1.4641 if I print it out. Cool and note it has 5 digits in it. Next I will do something like ctx.prec where prec stands for precision and set it to 3. And let's just print out the same thing as we did before and see what the result is this time around. Once I hit run, you see we get the result as 1.46 where the precision of the digits are set to 3 digits. So all we are telling is when we set the precision to 3, we just round off to 3 significant figures. In our current example, we have set our precision context globally. What I mean by that is if we add another print statement and inside it print num to the power of 3, we see I get the output as 1.33 rounded off to 3 significant digits. In an ideal application, we don't want this to happen. We need a way to set multiple precision values for different scenarios. This is where the local context function comes in. So the local context function returns a context manager that restores the original environment after the end of the with block. Now let me just first import local context then declare a variable called num and set it to decimal 1.1. I write a with statement like with local context as ctx and within the with statement I set the precision to 2 and print number to the power of 4. And I come out of the with statement and print number to the power of 4. Please keep an eye on the indentation or else you will get a wrong result. Now. If I run this, you see we get 1.5 and 1.4641 respectively. Now we can use multiple width statement and set multiple precision values. The next type we have to look into are the fraction types. So when working on proportion and probability, it is very important to accurately represent integer fractions. Thus the Python standard library offers us fraction type from the fractions module. Let us quickly take a look at that example. Like we did previously, we will first import the fraction type from the fraction module like this. Now let's create a variable called num1 and call the fraction type and pass two parameters 1 and 3 to it. Next let's create a new variable called num2 and pass it two parameters 1 and 7. So the fraction type accepts two parameters as you saw. The first one is the numerator and the second one is the denominator. Now if I print num1 multiplied by num2 and run it I get 1 by 27 which is true. In simple terms the fraction type stores two variables the numerator and the denominator and perform basic math operations on them. It's that easy and saves us a lot of time. Next, let's look at the complex type in Python standard library. In Python, we can represent a complex unit in code as 1j. Most mathematical text use the letter i to represent a complex unit and in Python code we use 1j and that's how simple it is to work with complex number in Python. Let's just look at some simple examples. For now, let's say z is equal to 1 plus 1j which means we are adding 1 
to a complex number and storing it in the variable z. Next, let's print the result of adding z plus 2 and now if we run it, we get the result as 3 plus the complex number. At this point in time, it sounds so subtle, but it will make a lot of sense as we write more complex functions. Let's finish off the Python types by looking at simple methods available in Python complex types. So the first one is the conjugate method. All it does is returns the complex type with a sign inverted. Let me just print c.conjugate and guess what will happen to the output before I run. The output is 1 minus the complex number. Simple right? I hope you got that one right. Now that we are done with Python numerical types, let's look at basic math function and in the next video we will learn numpy arrays and matrices because if I stuff everything into a single video it's going to be a very long video and I don't like making very long videos. The math module in the python standard library provides all the standard mathematical functions along with common constants and some utility functions and it can be imported using the following command import math that's way too simple right? Once it's imported we can use any of the mathematical functions that are contained in this module. Like for example, let us just print out the square root of a non-negative integer like this. Print math.sqrt4. Without me running this, you can tell the answer is 2, right? It's way too simple. But I told the square root method works only on a non-negative integer. But what happens, instead of 4, we give it negative 4 and hit run. As expected, we get a value error which tell math domain error. Since the result of negative 4 is a complex number and to solve it, we can import cmath package from the python standard library. Now, if we replace the math package with the cmath package and run it, this time around we get the result as 2j which is a complex number. Next, we will look into the basic trigonometric function available to us like sine, cosine and tangent. Also, pi is a reserved keyword in python like in most languages whose value is set to 3.14. So let's take a look at that now. Let's create a new variable called theta which is math.pi divided by 4. Now let's just print the result of sine, cos and tan values of the theta just like this and now if I run we get the appropriate result on our right. The inverse trigonometric function are named a cos, a sin and a tan in the math module. So if I copy and paste a quick example and run it, you see we get the appropriate result on the right. The log function in math module performs logarithmic operations. It has an optional argument to specify the base of the logarithm. Now I will just print the log function and pass the value 10 into it without any base and by default the base value is set to 2. If I run it, now we get the output. Next, let's just print the result of log function where the value is 10 and the base is also set to 10. And if I run it this time around, we get the value as 1 as expected. Just to give you guys a heads up, math package also contains the gamma and the Gaussian error function which are very important in terms of statistical calculations. Let me just Paste the code snippet here real quick and run it. Expective output on the right. Although you don't know how we arrived at this solution on the right, we will soon answer this question. There are a few functions in the math module worth noting before we end this video. The first one being the com function, which is called with arguments n and k, which returns the number of ways to choose k items from a collection of n without repeats if the order is not important. It is much easier to explain it with an example. So let us print math.com and pass phi and 2 as its first and second argument respectively. And when we run it, we get the value 10 as the result. The result tells there are 10 ways of choosing the any two items in a collection of phi items. How cool is that? Next we have a factorial fraction which returns the factorial of a number. If I print this out real quick and hit run, we get the factorial of 5 as 120. 
Finding the factorial of a number is a very common coding interview problem. You can check out the link in the description below to find a video for that as well. Just to show you how the coding interview looks, I will update the value of the factorial from 5 to negative 5 and hit run. You see we get a value error, right? This is the kind of thing the interviewer looks in your code and sees if you have handled these edge conditions. The math module also contains a function that returns the greatest common divisor of its arguments called GCD. The greatest common divisor of A and B is the largest integer k such that k divides both A and B exactly. A small example will look something like this and when I run the code, we get the following result. There is one small thing I forgot to show you when we were talking about the floating point type, the fsum function. The fsum function performs addition on iterables of number and keep track of the sum each step to reduce the error in the result. If you have any, if you have any experience in JavaScript, then it is similar to the reduce method. So here is a quick example. Let's create a variable called nums which is set to a list with 0.1 as its value and multiply it 10 times. So if I print nums, we see the list has 0.1 10 times, right? Makes sense. Next, let's call the sum function and pass the nums list to it and print it out. And now if I hit run, I get 0 0.99999. But see what happens when I run math.fsum and pass nums to it. Now when I run it, we get 1 as the answer which is much more accurate. This might sound silly but right now precision is everything in machine learning. So it is very important that right from the very beginning we cultivate the habit of precisely rounding off the values. With that said we have reached the end of the video guys. I hope you enjoyed it. If so drop a like and subscribe. See you in the next video. Happy coding until then.